Open up your Bible with me, if you would, to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Um, I cooked up something especially for Sunday, so I preached a different message last night. Um, but I'm going to preach something different today, and we're going to preach part two of our At Your Word series. Right? Because at, at the end of the day, man, man we want to hear the voice of God, and we want to respond to that voice. And, and I want to read out of John chapter 2, verse 13. It reads like this, it says, the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making, now this is, this is buck wild Jesus, so you gotta buckle up for this. I know, I know some of you, you're used to like blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus carrying the, <laughs> you understand Jesus was not blonde hair and blue eyed, right? I'm just like, just theologically, Okay, just making sure, just helping everybody. In verse 15, it says, and making a whip of cords, he goes buck wild crazy. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers, and he throws over their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Jesus does not like pigeons. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His, dis his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews, they're all upset. The Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Pretty much like, who are you that you feel so comfortable doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy the temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. I wanna preach a message today from this whole thought of at your word, but I wanna preach specifically on this thought of when he wants to do something new when he wants to do something new how many of you know god wants to do something new in your life come on let's pray together today over the preaching of god's word god i thank you so much <clears throat> god that we don't have to eat yesterday's stale bread but god there are new things that you're calling us to new ways of living new ways of thinking new things to go after god there are new songs to be sung there are new blessing. There's new things, God, that you are calling us to. And so, God, we thank you for the old, but we don't live off the old. God, we step into the new. Let our hearts always be open to something new that you are doing in us. And let us not be content merely to stay where we are, but let us grow as long as we have breath in our lungs. In Jesus' name, and we all said, <clears throat> amen. Amen. Um, you, you ever been frustrated by change? You ever have something change and you're like, I really liked the way that it was. Like, why does everything have to change? In fact, when we're in growth track, uh, one of the things that I actually do talk about is, you know, one of our values, right? One of our ministry cultures is creativity. And I always say, you know, people love that until you change something they like. Because none of us really like change that much, especially when it's stuff that we really, really like. I, I, for example, for me, um, I don't like technology change. Like I am a late adopter. When it, like I remember when um, uh, uh, an, an iPod, I remember when the iPod came out and I was like, this is the dumbest thing ever. Like I've worked really hard on my CD book like, I have worked hard on this. I even have the cases with the parental advisory little thing on the bottom right. Like, like, like I have it all, and, and, and like, I have worked hard. I was like, this is the dumbest thing I'll never have. I literally said, this, I'll never have an iPod. Of course, I got an iPod. I don't, I don't like technology change. Like, like, by the way, I don't even like how our staff like does correspondence. There's like a whole new way of doing correspondence that I do not like. I make uh, the, the life of our staff much more difficult because there are some things I just refuse to do. Like I still like when they print me stuff out. I'm like, hey, when you come to a meeting with me and we're looking at a budget, I need that thing printed out. I want to, I got to touch it. Otherwise it doesn't exist. 
I've got to feel that thing. Or, or, or like if they're ever sharing a document with me, like they hate this. Like if they're ever sharing a document, like the other day I asked Johnny Pena for something. And, and, and if I ask for you to send me a Word doc, I want a Word doc attached to the email. I do not want to be invited to some Google Drive group that I don't know how to use. Don't invite me to that stuff, man. Like drag that little Google Doc and drag it into the email so I can click on it. I don't know my password for the Google Doc thing. <laughs> Gotta do too much. I still go to my staff on Sundays after service so that I can post about like the amazing thing that God is doing in our church. And, and, and I'm like, yo, I need someone to send me some photo, like text me some photos. Can you guys text me like 15 photos from the day? And they're like, well, you know, that's how they talk in my mind. That's like, they're like, well, you know, you can just jump on the photo share thing. No, I don't want to jump on the photo share thing. Just text me photos. I, 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 just, I just don't like change, especially technology change. And, and, and what's, what's interesting, I think if you were to talk to people, I think some people would probably say something like this. Some people might say something like, well, I think I do better with change than most, right? And sometimes I think we have this misnomer that some people do good with change, some people do bad with change, but I actually don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. Some of us are just attached to less things than others. Right? So some of us are, are, are just attached to less things. Some of us are very attached to a lot of things. Some of us are attached to less things. But the same person that says they are great with change, really they're only great with it until something is changed that they really like. Right? So, so when it comes to actual stuff that, oh man, I really liked that. I didn't want that to change. I wasn't comfortable with that changing. I wasn't interested in that changing. Once something that they really care about changes, then they're like the rest of us then all of a sudden they struggle with change. And the reality is this, God wants you to operate at your most optimal level, right? And sometimes in church culture, we call that like your grace zone, right? God wants you to operate in your grace zone, you know, where, where your story, your gift mix, your perspective, your talents, your abilities, your anointing, it all gets thrown into the pot. And then God goes, okay, with that. And then, and then what comes in is the grace of God. And, and, and then all that gets thrown into the pot. And then God goes, okay, I'm going to use your life to its fullest capacity. But, but sometimes, come on, let's be honest, right? Sometimes, sometimes good enough for us is good enough. Like if we're being honest, like some of you, it's like your house is clean ish. Like what if I came up to you right now? I'm like, Hey, Christine and I, Hey, we're coming over right after service. We'll just ride with you. <laughs> you might go, our house is, we're clean ish. Right? So sometimes good enough is, is good enough for a lot of us. In, in fact, I, I know this because that's how I treat my vehicle. Like as long as my vehicle gets me point A to point B, I, I, every time I go in for an oil change, we, we get to see how much I care about my car. Because right? you ever go in for an oil change? By the way, I don't trust none of these people. And if you work in that industry, we're really glad you're here in church. You can repent, turn from your ways, and start telling us the truth. <laughs> right, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to get my oil change, and all I want, I'll bring a coupon. <laughs> like this oil change says, nineteen ninety nine, right? So you bring, like, hey, cool o oil change, Jiffy, nineteen ninety nine. Here you go, and they're like, okay, cool. And you go in there for your oil change, and then they'll come out with your whole engine. <laughs> they'll bring your whole engine out, throw it on the table, boom, here you go. Um, sir, I don't know if you saw this, but I don't know if you know this, but your, uh, your vehicle is not operating at its optimal level. Um, you need a new filter. You need a new this. You know, I don't know anything about cars, so I'm not going to use terminology. Like, you need this. You need that. And you're like, bro, like, no, just throw it. Okay, it, it, yeah, it does look pretty bad. And they always bring out a clean one. <laughs> and this is what a brand new one looks like. And this is what is currently in your vehicle. And I'm like, I don't even know if that's really from my vehicle. I don't trust you. It could be anybody's vehicle. But they always bring you a clean one, and then they bring you what's in your car. 
The reality is, is I don't really care if my car's running at its optimal level. I just kind of care, is it going to get me to work tomorrow? I just kind of care, is it safe enough for my kids to ride in it? And I think a lot of times in life, we just kind of settle for the, I'm just trying to get from point A to point B. And God is going, hey, uh, there's some things that if you altered, that if you shifted, that if you actually allowed me to do some new things in your life would actually help you run at a higher capacity and a higher level. God wants to maximize everything that he has put in you. But in order to do this, he's going to want to do a new thing in you. That's why the Bible talks about this a lot. Like, right, we, we have language in the scriptures where It says, hey, behold, I'm doing a new thing in you. Do you not perceive it? The Bible talks about things like, hey, we're going to sing a what? A new song to the Lord that God is interested in doing new things. But there's a process to a new thing. The reason why there has to be a process for a new thing is this is going to blow your mind because new does not mean old. (laughs) So so, so if you're going to shift from a new thing, from an old thing, There has to be a process that takes place. And here's my point. My only point is this, is that when Jesus is going to do something new, there will always be a breaking down of what was. When Jesus is going to do, now we wish he just did the new thing, right? Like we wish he'd say, hey, just do the new thing. I like the new thing. The new thing's fun. The new thing's fresh. But in order for him to do the new thing, he has to break down the old thing. He has to break off the old thing over your life. He has to break off the old patterns, the old, the old habits, the old ways of thinking, the ways of thinking that are trying to exalt themselves above the preeminence of Christ. And so, so Jesus has to go, hey, we're, we got to break that thing down. And that's exactly what is going on in John chapter 2 that Jesus is doing. This is very early on in the life of his ministry. And it says the Passover is going on and Jesus goes up and in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers are sitting there and Jesus goes in and he's literally, like you gotta think about this scene. He's going in there and he has a whip. He's just like whipping like people like, hey, get out of here. He's flipping over tables. The animals are like, wah! The animals are freaking out, going everywhere. The people are like, oh my, this dude's crazy. And, and there's all this stuff going on. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered what was, risen, what was written. Zeal for your house will consume me. Now, when Christina and I first got married, we got married. Um, uh, Christina was a year out of college, and I was like months out of college. And when we first got married, we were living in the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, when you're first getting married, and a lot, a lot of couples in here that got married, like especially if you got married younger like we did, we were 22 and 23, um, you're, you're just starting life out together and you don't realize all the stuff you have to buy. Like you don't realize, like we went to the dollar store and by the way, I'm this bad marketing. Not everything. I don't know if you knew this, not everything at the dollar store is a dollar. Like they need, they need to change like, like dollar 50 store. Like, like they need to change the name of that store, I think. And and, uh, and, and so we would go, because, you know, you don't think about things like, oh, we, we need salt and pepper shakers. Like, oh, we need a dustpan. And, and, and so when you start life together as a married couple, you, you're, you're kind of building your life together. And what's funny is, at least us, like, we didn't have tons of resources. Uh, two things really hurt us. We didn't have tons of resources, and we had no decorative eye. And so early on in a marriage, it's like, you'll take anything. You're like, oh, we got a couch. It's like nasty. Somebody died on it. You're like, I don't care. We have a couch. This is amazing. <laughs> like we, we just didn't have, we had random pieces in our house. We got pictures that we don't even like. Uh, like, like we got things that don't even make sense. Tables that, 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 and chairs that don't even match. We got, like, we got three of those chairs and one of those chairs. And you're like, it'll work. Then we got four chairs, praise God. And you're just throwing all this stuff together and you're just happy, you're in love, you're having sex like twice, three times a day. You're like, what else do you need? You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and so, 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 so then you're just kind of like in this, in this vein, sorry, I, children in the room, that's on you, they should be in kids' church. And so, <laughs> you're actually of age, huh? Are you, are you you're, okay, you're GC, okay, well, <laughs> we're glad you're here. <laughs> I know them, it's the Bosco's, it's fine, they'll be back. <laughs> They're not leaving the church. <laughs> 
But that's all you need, right? Because you don't care. In fact, we literally just like had like an overstuffed like beanbag in our TV room. So we had, we had an overstuffed beanbag in our TV room. Uh, uh, we, we had just purchased, like we saved up and purchased a new TV and it sat on like an Apple box. And I don't mean like an Apple computer box. I mean like a box that used to house apples. Like, I mean, <laughs> legitimately, it just sat on there for a year. That was our little entertainment center. And then what's funny is well, you start to get a little older. You start to have more resources. You actually start to develop your style and what are things you like. And eventually, right, you get to a place where you can start like replacing things and, and you can start like taking stuff out and you can start going, okay, cool. Now we have like a style. And after 17 years of marriage, it's like, you know, okay, cool. Now our, our house kind of makes sense and we don't just have this hodgepodge of stuff and th- that we were just kind of happy to have. And, and, and what I'm wondering is I would be so fascinated if we could somehow open up the door, all of us, to the interior of our lives. I, I, I wonder if, if we could just like walk into the interior of each other's lives. Some of you are like, oh, good God. <laughs> but if we walked into the interior of your life and the interior of my life, like, like what would we see? Like, would we see a couch that has to go? Like, like, like would we see a lamp that doesn't even work? Like, would we, would we see like blinds that like, oh, th- those don't even really like pull up. You got to like Jimmy rig it. You got to like do it yourself. Like, like, like what would we see? And, and the reality is this, like over time, this is called like spiritual formation. The Bible says that we are to become what? More like Christ. And, and so as we're doing this, what, what you got to be willing to do is you have got to be willing to let God remove some things from your house before he can add some things. Again, we just want God to add to our mess, but God goes, no, 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 the the decor won't make sense. This is why, honestly, you have a lot of people that profess Christ, but their life doesn't make sense with what they profess. Because you walk into the interior of their life and you're like, that's weird because why are you a mad Christian? C.S. Lewis said, joy is the serious business of heaven. So how can you like serve God and know that you were a sinner and God redeemed you and restored you and did not deal with you as your sins deserve and still be so judgmental? The decorations don't go together. It, it, It doesn't make sense. But if Christina and I just kept collecting everything over the last 17 years and didn't go, okay, we got to give that couch away and we got to give that away and we got to, you know, we got to get rid of some stuff so that the new stuff can come in, it it just wouldn't make any sense. So what I would encourage you is, here's this very simple question, what has to go in you? What has to go? What isn't working for you? And sometimes here's the most dangerous part. We can get comfortable with even things that aren't working for us. This is why, by the way, you need some trusted, fresh eyes to go into your house and go, yeah, that couch, I know it's really comfy to you. It's stained. <laughs> it's kind of ugly. I, I know you really like it, and I know that, that, that it's kind of nice for you. But it's, so, so what Jesus is doing is Jesus steps into their money-changing system. Jesus steps into their sacrificial system where people are, are, are buying sacrifices, and, and they're exchanging money in the temple. And Jesus goes, this is not it. And I am here to rearrange some things. But before I die for your sin and conquer sin, death, and the grave by resurrecting, i got to blow this thing up first. And that's what Jesus came in to do. This is why, listen, you cannot follow Jesus and not expect some things to get blown up a little bit. You can't follow Jesus and go, oh, he just adds, he just adds, he just adds. Right, he wants to add so you run at your optimal level, but in order for him to add, he has to remove. I think a very practical step that we could all do today is just go home and just jot down some things. What is not working for me? And when Jesus comes in and he flips over tables, we have a few choices. Number one, we can be offended. I just think, can I just say this? I think offense is one of the most unhelpful realities that you and I can live in. It's just unhelpful. It doesn't serve you. 
And so when Jesus comes in or, or, or somebody who's preaching God's word comes in or a trusted friend who loves God comes in and says, hey, this is kind, kind of off, you can take offense, but it's not gonna serve you. That's one route you can go. You, ne- next route you can go is you can be confused. Because sometimes we get confused because sometimes the only Jesus we're presented is like, wait, I thought he like loved me just as I am. But then they forget the other part of that often used quote is, yes, he loves you just as you are, but too much to let you stay in that place. Right? And so, and, and so yes, so sometimes we're confused. We're like, wait, I thought Jesus just loved me. And I thought it was going to be me and Jesus, and I thought he was fine with everything that I did. And it's like, no, 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 you're confused because Jesus wants to come in and rearrange and change some things. Or, or the third route we can go is we can be encouraged that there is something better. Anytime Jesus wants to come in and remove something in order to add something, it's because he wants to make your life better. And verse 18 is interesting. It says, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Again, essentially, who are you? Who do you think you are? And Jesus answered him. I feel like Jesus is like a rapper in this one. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. It's like, whoa. Like, we have context for this stuff. These guys had no context for this. Like, Jesus is talking about him dying on a cross, raising three days later. The Jews are like, whoa, this is, that's kind of weird. It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and he's going to raise it up in three days, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. You see, the new thing isn't always easy to discern. The new thing is not always super easy to discern. In fact, um, when I was working at uh, Southeastern University, I was the campus pastor there, and uh, I was sitting down having a conversation with a guy named Ken Archer. And Ken Archer is just like this brilliant Bible teacher and just, just an incredible guy. Him and I were having lunch one time. And uh, you ever know, like, <laughs> you ever having a conversation with somebody and half the words they're using are words you don't understand, but you're just kind of like, uh-huh, word? <laughs> yep. And, and you either got to ask, like, you know, every once in a while, it's fine if there's like one word and I'm like, I don't know what that word is. But if it's like, you know, a word per sentence, you're like, I can't do that. I can't ask every time this guy, you know, like... <laughs> And so him and I are having this conversation, and I got to be honest, I don't really know what he's saying. Like, I don't really know what he's talking about. He's talking like like he is in deep, deep, deep waters, and I'm like, wow, I'm impressed. And and we're talking for like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and at the end, again, I only caught like, you know, half the conversation, and at the end he goes, and Andrew, that right there is why what you do is so important. (laughs) I was like, oh no. <laughs> Sometimes we just miss things. You, you, you ever watching a show with somebody and, and in the show they say things and you're not sure if you're supposed to know that thing they just said? Like they'll use somebody's name and you're like, who is that? Like, are we supposed to know that right now? Are they gonna like fill us in? And and, and so sometimes somebody will ask, you know, don't you love those people that like talk to, like, hey, what's that mean? What's that? I'm like, I don't know. I've been on the journey as long as you have. I don't know, we're watching the same show. I, 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 I don't really know. And, and all you're hoping is like, okay, I hope that's not supposed to be something I know. I, I hope they double back to that and like fill us in on what is actually being said. You sometimes have to stick with something long enough in order to understand everything that is going on. This, this is why, let me encourage you with this. You gotta stick around Jesus even when you don't understand them. You you, you, you gotta stay close enough. You you, you gotta stay connected to Jesus, even when he's maybe doing things and you're like, I don't fully understand it. I'm not fully aware of what is going on. Because here's what I found after 23 years of following Jesus, I found Jesus is pretty good. He's a pretty good writer of the story. And what he's very good at is he's very good at filling in the gaps when it is the right time. So there might be a time where you're like, I don't really know. Am I supposed to know this? Am I supposed to know what's going on? Am I supposed to be further along? Like, what is going on? And then 17 years later, you'll go, oh, I'm, I'm starting to see. And so, so instead of just like backing out and going, oh, I don't really understand this Christianity thing. I don't really understand this Jesus thing. I don't really understand this church thing. If, if you hang with it long enough, at the right time, Jesus is gonna lean in and he's gonna go, hey, here I am. And then in verse 22, I wanna have the team come up. I wanna finish with these thoughts. It says, when therefore, now, now this is amazing. 
So he goes in again. I want to paint the picture of the scene again. He goes in, ah, you know, he goes berserk roid rage on him. He, he cracks the whip and, and all this stuff is going on. And, and they're like, whoa, like, who do you think you are? Like, why are you doing this? And Jesus is like, hey, like tear down the temple and three days later, it'll be up again. Like, and they're like, what? So confused. And then after this, maybe like a year or two later, he's crucified Three days later, he's resurrected, and he's hanging out with his disciples. And in verse 22, it says, when therefore he was raised from the dead. So now, again, the, the, the writer is writing the gospel in total view of what has taken place. And, and so he says, when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken, so they remember it. I wonder how they remembered it. I wonder how it came to them, right? So they're hanging out, all of a sudden they see Jesus resurrected, he's teaching, and they're like, oh, do you remember that time Jesus went buck wild? <laughs> they're like talking to each other. You remember when he went into the temple and he was throwing over tables, and then he said that like weird thing where he was like, nah, tear down the temple three days later, like, do you do, do you remember that? This is what he was talking about. Right here. We're living in it. We, we, when we bring our kids, uh, they call it Minnie's house. <laughs> we bring our kids to Disney World. Um, Every once in a while, right, just, probably just like you, if you're ever driving somewhere, you just go on GPS, right, and you go, okay, what's the fastest route? And, and sometimes, oftentimes, <laughs> I-4 is pretty backed up. I don't know if you guys knew that. <laughs> and so it'll have us go kind of right, right, these random ways and, you know, like I call it scary movie ways, you know what I mean? <laughs> so we'll be going like the scary movie way and our kids will get frustrated because they know the I-4 way. Right, and so when we go the I-4 way, because they want to see Mickey's ears on the electrical power lines. <laughs> That's when they know they're close, right? It's when they know they're close. And so when we go the back way, they'll kind of get frustrated because they're like, wait, I thought we were going to Minnie's house. Where are you taking us? And so they'll be in the back. I'm like, first of all, you, can, you need more resistance in your life. We got to figure that out. <laughs> and they'll be frustrated be, because we're not going the way that they know. Because the way that they know is comfortable, the way that they know has indicators, the, the, the way that they know has more activity, the way that they know, like the way that they know is familiar to them. But when we go this back way, and, and, and oftentimes when we go this back way, it's not until literally like you pull up and you're driving through the like Walt Disney World and all the goofies all there and all that stuff, right? Then they're like, oh, okay, mom and dad are okay. <laughs> I wonder how you and I respond to the aha moment. Like, like, like how do we do? Because, well, you know what I found about us, me, you? We got short memories. Like, <laughs> Oftentimes we forget. We like to think of ourselves as more faithful than we've actually been. And oftentimes we forget that for most of us, if not all of us, Jesus has gotten us here kicking and screaming the entire time. He had us go through painful things that we complained about and that we were kicking and screaming. We're going, wait, no, we're going the wrong way. In fact, remember when Jesus healed 10 people? Remember the story and, and 10 people left him, they had leprosy, and all of a sudden, while they're walking away, they all got healed. And if you remember the story, if you've been around church, you know that one person turned around. One person turned around and they had the, oh, wait a minute. Jesus said, go, and that we were going to be healed. That's right. The other nine just kept it pushing. Maybe forgot. Maybe started going, oh, it's just a natural process. 
Maybe we're like, oh yeah, I've been doing this like new health thing. Like I've been doing this new health thing. It's probably that. One person turned around and said, whoa, I, I remember, I remember, I remember, I remember. You did a new thing in me. You did a new thing in me. Can, can I encourage you? When you have the, oh, moment that the disciples have here, this is what he was talking about. Can I just encourage you to just get on your knees, put your forehead to the ground and go, other people might forget. I'm not going to forget. God's been good and God's been faithful to me. And God has done new thing after new thing after new thing over our life. Come on, church, let's stand to our feet.